And I like, I, at one point I was like, is this just a choice this makeup person is making or is this a very 70s look? And I Googled 70s eyeliner and mm-hmm. it was like exactly one-to-one what she was wearing, which was incredible. Oh, totally. Because even though she's an impoverished uh, governess, she still has to relate to the girls of the time. Totally. <laughs> the girls of 1970. Yes. <laughs> Welcome back to the studio, Lillian. How are you doing? I am doing so good, Piper. It feels like so long since we've done this. It really does, especially since we're actually talking about an adaptation of Jane Eyre today. We're talking about an adaptation of Jane Eyre, which is the (laughs) premise of the podcast. The whole podcast is about that. (laughs) And we've plum run out of adaptations to we get our have grubby little not hands on run out of them we have a, <laughs> a few left and we've also i think we've also discovered a lot of things about jane eyre that we want to talk about that aren't straight up adaptations but yeah it's good to be back where we belong which is exactly. watching a very hard to find adaptation <laughs> and really struggling our way through it and then sharing our opinions on the internet Oh, totally. Well, this was one where we pushed this back a couple of times. It's 15 <laughs> episodes. Um, and they're not that long. They're like, they're half hour episodes, but still yeah. it felt like a lot at the beginning. I don't know about you, Lillian, but I'm so glad we watched this version. I think a couple of times I saw Lillian at a party and I was like a little drunk also, but I was like, what if we just didn't do this one? And she's like, you can do it. You can, you can watch this. And I'm glad that she told drunk me to watch it. Cause I, I'm very glad to talk about Truly, this. Truly. I was leaving a party and I was like, we've got a week. And she was like, please don't make me do this. And I'm like, I'm going to make you do it. <laughs> so uh, current Piper says thank you to past Lillian for that. Thank you. <laughs> past Lillian will always be a hard ass. Future Lillian will always be a hard ass. <laughs> <laughs> that we can count on. Um, but Lillian, what, can you give us is, more info? Oh, no, I'll do it. Yeah, Sorry. take it away. Okay, I'm going to take this and I'm going to run away with it. So we watched a Spanish mini series. Well, it's not. A, so it's not a mini series. It's a serial. They used to do this Spanish uh, television program between 1963 and 1978 on what it was called Televisión Español, mm-hmm. um, or TVE, which has now become RTVE, which I do not know what the R stands for. And if you mm-hmm. do know, text me. But <laughs> it was a program entitled Novella, and they took different books and turn them into a season of TV. Um, so they did that with Jane Eyre in 1971. Um, and it was long and I have a lot of thoughts about it. (laughs) Yay. I do too. I, okay. First thing that I'm just going to say right off the bat, I really appreciate the obvious budget that this program had Mm -hmm. because the sets were awesome. I think some of the best sets we've ever seen for one of these like TV shows. So yeah, first thing I want to say. It's, it's certainly like, it's so funny now that we've watched so many of these that I can like place this in our Jane Eyre timeline and Mm -hmm. be like, okay, so this was like immediately right after this one, but it was right immediately right before this other one. But you can tell that they're really doing this and all of these things, Um, which is, it's just a funny thing that only you and I, and I guess Charlene can do. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But yeah, before we get into thoughts, opinions, critiques, Mm -hmm. suggestions, Lillian has to do her favorite thing on the podcast, which is do a as fast as she can recap of the story of Jane Eyre. It's not that I don't like it. It's that I'm bad at it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we were talking before. We're like, whose turn is it? And you're like, crap, it's me. (laughs) And I'm like, you can do it, Lillian. I believe in you. It's because I'm going to try really hard, especially with long ones. I get lost in the winding road that is Jane Eyre and I start sharing too many details. So um, I'm going to do my best to actually keep this one short. Um, cool. ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Um, so this okay. is just in case you have no idea what Jane Eyre is or the plot of Jane Eyre, but you decided to check out a Jane Eyre podcast because maybe you're on a long road trip and your friend who loves our show is like, I don't care. We're listening to this. And so now you get to know what the story is. Um, also, 
I I love all of our fans. Bad friend. Play a different one. They're better. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, here we go. Ready. So Jane Eyre is the story of a little girl who is very blonde and beautiful and kind of knows it um, and is living with her aunt and her cousin is a total asshole, but she doesn't fight him because she's a good little girl. And then she goes to what is often referred to as an orphanage, but it's kind of a school. Um, And she meets a friend who she definitely doesn't have any sort of romantic feelings for at all. Um, And then she makes friends with the teacher also. And then her friend who's a child dies and then she grows up and is a gorgeous adult now and she goes off with this lovely letter of recommendation to work as a governess for a little french girl who wants to learn english but she only speaks spanish (laughs) (laughs) and they uh she ends up meeting her boss the little girl's um like dad kind of, um, named Mr. Rochester and she falls in love with him. And then that man, uh, like falls in love with her. He's very sweet. Everything's really great up until they have their wedding with nine other dudes there. And then they find out that he's actually already married. And instead of explaining that to the woman he was going to marry, he explains it to the nine other dudes. And then she (laughs) leaves, ends up in a hospital for a while. Um, and hears that, uh, that man's wife is now dead and he's blind and happily ever after. A minute, 24 seconds. It's better than it could have been. You could tell yeah. the part that I got mad at. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I was okay. like, you can't do this now. You can't do this now. That's what the whole podcast is for. Dude. Okay. So before we get into like details and stuff, I want to start off by saying that this is a, so this was made uh, in Spain and mm-hmm. We do not have an English dub or sub option. Mm -hmm. So we were watching it um, just in its native Spanish. Mm -hmm. And from certain things that you said, it sounds like you were doing your kind of like Google Translate. I was not. I was just listening. Um, In this case, I did take like five years of Spanish in middle school and high school. So I got the gist of some of the things they were saying. Definitely did not get specifics. So you probably have more info than I do about some of the details. Some of the stuff, but I did find, um, so I didn't do it as much as I did with the Italian one because I did find this easier to follow because it is more true to the story Mm -hmm. um, until the end when it takes a real hard left. Um, (laughs) There's a few deviations from the story, but for the most part, it's really, like of the foreign adaptions we've watched, and I say foreign, I mean uh, languages that aren't English, mm-hmm. um, that we've watched. This is probably the truest to the text. I, there were particular scenes where like Google translate translated it to lines of Jane Eyre. So like, cool. I, I, it is, I think easier to follow without doing what I did. Um, mm-hmm. but I did, I, so I did it a lot less frequently than I did with like the Italian one. Yeah. So if you are listening to this, you're probably a Jane Eyre fan. Um, Whether or not you speak Spanish, um, I think this is worth checking out and it's available on YouTube. They have um, all the episodes there, but then also this uh, RTVE app. um, Yes. And on the website as well. um, It's the website was down this morning, which was how I, not that I watched most of it this morning. Um, (laughs) I'm a professional. But yeah, so it's also, there's a random YouTube channel we had to dig for, a, I had to dig for a while to find, but um, <laughs> we got there. We did. So Lillian, I want to start by talking about just some of the like visual things, mm, since okay. that's mostly what I was able to absorb. Okay. <laughs> so first of all, my first thought is about the 70s like style of things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so Jane's hair, um, it reminded me a lot, first of all, of um, probably my second favorite ever adaptation, which is the one with George C. Scott. Mm -hmm. They had, that was also in the 70s. And both of those Janes, they had like the exact same hairdo, which to me reads as this. Um, It's the 70s. So Mm -hmm. they want big hair because that's what's fashionable at the time. But they're still trying to stay true to the parted down the middle bangs off Uh to the sides of your face kind of thing. So imagine 
like what you normally see in art or in adaptations of Jane Eyre, you know, that down the middle, but it's like incredibly teased and like has all this volume. And there was also many times when Jane had the most elaborate hairdos that went back like a good foot or so. Uh And there's even a scene where she like leans back against this wall and her hair hits the wall and there's a good foot of space between her body and her hair and the wall. And it was amazing. So Jane's hair. Wow. Um, I have a whole, like my entire fashion section is entitled 70s fashion is too strong because (laughs) all three adaptions we've watched from the 70s, the uh, 1971 with George C. Scott that you mentioned and the 1973 BBC with um, Piper's favorite. (laughs) (laughs) And the source of our online drama. (laughs) We don't actually advocate violence for anyone listening to this who jumped right from the Razzie episode to this one. Oh my god, my brain is 70s styles talking about oh, what's um, his name? Oh, uh Michael Jaston. Thank you. Oh my god, that the was man... like a small stroke. <laughs> the man I don't want to punch. <laughs> no one has ever wanted to punch. Well, we don't want to punch him. He's incredible. He seems yeah. like a lovely human being. <laughs> It's his Rochester that half of the podcast wants to punch. Oh my god. I made a I made a joke about that. Someone got very upset, took it very seriously. And followed so. us across the internet. I just blocked <laughs> them on every platform. We we don't ad- we, I sincerely we never advocate violence. Anyway. <laughs> um, but 70s fashion. So I truly it is so funny to me how we always see elements of like the fashion of the time. Or sometimes they're just doing like a generic old timey fashion and they're not really um, fitting into Layla's uh, specific 1847 <laughs> fashion window. Um, but the the interesting thing about this is that the ones that I noticed the fashion of the moment that the adaption was created the most is the 70s. Yes. And I, I so I've decided that that just means that 70s fashion trends are so strong and so mm-hmm. specific um, that they're more easily identifiable and they make their way into period dramas because Miss Temple at one point has glasses that there's <laughs> no way those aren't from the 70s. <laughs> um, Jane's hair was one I noted. Jane's eyeliner is oh my gosh. so 70s. And it's amazing. So intense. There's also so like these the the quality of the film was really good. So we had quite a few like, you know, up close shots where you could really just like appreciate mm-hmm. her makeup. Um and yeah, so not only like the thick like cat eye um a, upper lip eyeliner, but also a very intense mm-hmm. under eye solid black line. And I was like, wow, she's rocking it. <laughs> and I like, I, at one point I was like, is this just a choice this makeup person is making? Or is this a very seventies look? And I Googled seventies eyeliner and mm-hmm. it was like exactly one-to-one what she was wearing, which was incredible. Oh, totally. Cause even though she's an impoverished, uh, governess, she still has to relate to the girls of the time. <laughs> totally. The girls of 1970. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and then the last one is the wedding dress, which in those other seventies episodes, we talked about how the wedding dresses were so seventies. Yes. So big fan. Our- but then also, of course, we have to shout out Mr. Rochester's ruffled uh, shirt front, <laughs> like he's going to prom. It was so good. <laughs> it was so good. Well, he explained to all these other men the choices that he made. So funny. <sighs> okay. Okay. So there's four episodes of Jane's childhood. Mm-hmm. One that is fully at Gateshead. The next one is sort of a mix as she moves to Lowood. Uh, mm-hmm. And then the last two. Oh no, the last there's three and a half because um, the last one she grows up and then goes to Thornfield. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what do we think of her childhood? Um, I don't have many thoughts on this part. I again, without having the being able to understand exactly what they're saying, and there's lots of long moments of dialogue. Um, I thought it was just fine. Um, I was kind of distracted by, yeah, how blonde uh, little Jane was with her bangs. I haven't really seen the straight across bangs on little Jane like that before. Not a lot to share on that. Oh, except that like right away she meets her uncle, like as a young girl, 
she meets um yeah her uncle who lives in madeira and i'm like again i didn't have the translation for this so he comes and he talks to her and they have this cute moment but then he's like all right i guess i gotta go see ya and it's like why don't he seems really happy to see her. He's like, Tio, call me Tio, like uncle and yeah. all this stuff. Why didn't you take her with you? Was the journey too dangerous? Like, So this is an advantage of my uh, translation, uh, which is that she begs him to take her with him. And he okay. says he can't because he doesn't have enough money. Um, okay. And then later, just to close the loop on that, when she goes back to talking to Aunt Reed, um, that's where the letter basically is him being like, Hey, I have enough money now. Like, can you send my niece to me? Gotcha. Um, so it sort of is like establishing this additional layer of heartbreak that Aunt okay. Reed would do that to her when she has this, not just like, okay option, but like mm -hmm. great option. Yeah. Um, I also think because, so the end of the story completely erases Sinjin um, and mm -hmm. Jane's cousins and all of that. That's not in the story anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think I understand why they made the uncle show up at the beginning to then have that kind of family tie. And then when we know after, you know, what's revealed from Aunt Reed's deathbed scene, uh, we have that kind of closure of him. Because also it sounds like, I don't know why she didn't seek him out after that. Um, was he implied that he had passed away as well? Um, the lawyer came and similarly to in the book, he's like, hey, your uncle sent me. Um, he is dying. So you probably should just stick around here and then I'll get to you. And Jane goes, <laughs> I totally believe that. At first, I'm going to run away so that you can't even find me. Pew, 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 pew. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Seriously, you're about to have money coming to you, babe. Um, yeah, that's... <laughs> <laughs> Jane, that's so that's another thing that is somewhat different about this adaptation is um, and we've talked about this before. And this is also very true of the adaptations in the 70s, which I find really interesting, which is this Jane is quite a bit older than the 19 year old Jane that mm -hmm. we're supposed to be picturing or 18 or 19 year old Jane that we're supposed to be picturing. So um, the actors, I have the ages for both uh, the actors who played Jane, Maria, Louisa. Marigold? Mar nope, there's no G in there. I'm going to put it in here. Oh my gosh. I love that you try. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> One day I'll learn how to read. Um, <laughs> um, Maria Luisa Merlo. Like the wine. Then, oh, like the wine. Like um, the and then wine. this is, uh, and the actor who plays Rochester. Uh, Rafael Arcos. Uh, so I want you to guess their ages. I would think that Maria was probably mm, 29. 30. I think she was late so 20. So real close. Okay, so she, she was 30. And Raphael looked like he would be 46. 45? Damn, girl. Hey, I know my, um, what are they called? May-December romances. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good at this. <laughs> Oh God, I love that for you. <laughs> Thank um, you. So it's my secret talent. <laughs> I do think like they do that. We'll talk about this more when we get there, but we've talked before about how Jane doing dumb things when she leaves Rochester makes sense when she's super distraught and 18. Mm -hmm. It does not make sense when she is a grown ass <laughs> woman who frankly seems perturbed but not distraught <laughs> yeah no there wasn't quite that agony um, that um, came through that's another like kind of overarching observation of this and i will admit to my own stereotypical expectations when i think of like you know a a spanish made series mm -hmm. i kind of go to sort of the um like telemundo like dramatic soap operas that's what mm -hmm. kind of pops into my head i was expecting a lot more like big dramatic uh melodrama of like that's how they're going to be putting out all of these intense emotions it felt rather reserved actually they, well and they plant some seeds of that too but there's particular moments where i'm like well this is the this is the part where you go big drama and you're doing <laughs> not that like what the hell guys um but it's totally fine i thought it worked um but it just it was not what i was expecting yeah uh, two more things that I have on the childhood is, um, first, I just have a note in here. Um, John, cousin John 
has a, a, the weirdest, cutest little outfit. He's so young and he's so angry and she does nothing about it. He attacks her and she just kind of goes, oh no, don't attack me. And I'm like, that's not Jane Eyre. Yeah. Also, she's like two feet taller than him. So it wouldn't be hard to like push him down. <laughs> yup. Um, uh, and then the other thing is... Um, she literally calls, I because I had the translation up for this, she literally calls Helen baby at one point, and Ooh. she helps her change clothes. Like, these two are in love. <laughs> yeah. No. Nah, they're um, into it, man. <laughs> big first crush energy. Speaking of changing clothes, just so I don't forget later, um, there's a lot of spicy kind of just, like, visual stuff. We see um, adult Jane, like, in her kind of busty nightgown several <laughs> times. And there's literally a scene, I think it's when uh, Rochester comes to her room to ask for help after Mason has Mason. been attacked. Mm -hmm. And he goes into her bedroom, first of all, just steamy, the fact that he's there. And she's like, in her busty nightgown and she's like, okay, I just need to change. And he's like, I'll turn around. And he's like, in the room while she's getting undressed and changing into a new outfit. I literally wrote in my notes, why would you stay in the room? All caps. Why is he in the room while she's getting naked? Yeah, I like, know. They, they go as far naked as she can go on camera before they cut to him, like, keeping his back to her. And then we, mm -hmm. like, cut back to her fully in a different outfit. I was like, why couldn't he wait outside the door? Yeah. Like, what is happening right now? <laughs> so, although despite him, like, staying in the room, I feel like this Rochester, first of all, I feel like he was a lot more tender and kind of sweet and, like, respectful than other Rochesters. When they cut back to him, like, he's not peeking. He says, he's got his back turned, and he's like, mm -hmm. all right, are you ready? Can I turn around now? Mm -hmm. And if it was, I'm just saying, if it was Kieran Hines, he'd be looking over his shoulder, being like, ooh, I see something. <laughs> Kieran, Kieran would be like, you stay there. And change in front of me, and I'm going <laughs> to stare at you. And if that makes you uncomfortable, that's your fucking problem. He's like, stop being such a prude, Jane. <laughs> um, I will say, similar to how I felt about Kieran Hines, though, is that this Rochester took a turn for me. Um, yeah. But we'll get to that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's when he invites all his bros to the wedding. Is that what killed you? <laughs> it was... That was the first red flag. And then immediately after that was the, actually, I hate you in this. Um, oh, that's so funny. But so the a lot of this, like, as we talked about, is pretty standard Jane Eyre adaption in a way that I really liked. Um, one note that I have is when she first, when she first gets to Thornfield and is like teaching. Okay. Actually, this is immediately after, um, she meets Rochester, which they don't do on horseback. We have to talk about this meeting mm -hmm. scene because this is a big departure. And this is one of my favorite things when we actually get a adaptation to talk about, say like, what did they do differently? Yes. So yes, um, there's no horseback scene. There's no road. Jane is praying in a church, which mm -hmm. this emphasis, and I think it might be a cultural thing, has a lot more emphasis on like, you know, going to church, being um, penitent about choices and stuff. It's also very, very Catholic, yes. which England famously not Catholic. Yeah. Spain famously Catholic. <laughs> yes. So I fucking love this move for a way to meet your love interest. <laughs> Jane is praying like she's a very personal thing. She's just in a church doing her prayers. And this guy waltzes up to her mid prayer, <laughs> reaches over to like pluck a flower from her dress. She appropriately smacks him across the face. <laughs> and he's just like, OK, anyway, bye. And like leaves. Well, and he acts like like he's reaching to her chest. Yes. And he it looks like he's reaching for her chest and then she slaps him. And then when he pulls the flower back, she acts like she should be embarrassed about that. I was like, no, nope, still the right move. Yeah. This guy bothered you during your prayers to like, if you're wearing get into a your flower personal space. and somebody pulls it off of your chest to smell it. <laughs> that is actually still on him. <laughs> but no, I did love that's the spunkiness that we didn't get his childhood. The fact that she just smacks him across the face. It's like, truly, good job. <laughs> there is truly more slapping in this than in other. That's one of my notes of, about the overall adaptation is that there's a lot more slapping in this version of Jane. 
<laughs> so another thing that I love, that's their first meeting, which is just like bizarre. So I think it's bizarre. mostly because they didn't want to deal with a horse. Um, but then <laughs> she like immediately afterwards gets back to Thornfield to be like, yo, Miss Fairfax, I was in the middle of my prayers and this guy like tried to grab my boob and I hit him in the face. But then he had like this flower excuse. And then she's like, oh, hey, by the way, this is your boss. And he's like kneeling by the fire, turns around, looks at her and he's like, hey, 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 it's me. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's just the whole movie had very good like here's what you're supposed to feel music <laughs> yes and they very much did a no <laughs> <laughs> very good the strings are going crazy be like da, da, da. Reveal. <laughs> um, big reveal um <laughs> the music was so spooky at some points too because yes they did a great job of establishing bertha right away first of all Speaking of things that are different, she doesn't quite laugh as much as she like kind of groans a lot. And yeah. then it switches to laughter in a way that is a very spooky. And there's like whispering voices. It mm -hmm. sounds like multiple voices. They definitely took the spooky, like is the supernatural route, which I love mm -hmm. when an adaptation does that. My other thing that I loved about this is that like you would hear like her spooky moaning and it was often accompanied by a literal like you know one of those token recordings of a a wolf from a werewolf uh -huh. movie going oh, 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 like howling in the distance and i'm like oh my god she's summoning the creatures of the night and they did such a good job with grace's character also because like randomly she'll just like be there so it's like the creepy music will happen and then grace will just be in the room that jane is in and it's like mm -hmm. oh, come on <laughs> um, i really great. liked yes agreed i loved how they used um grace's as the red herring role for this yes. they really leaned on that they um, did it so i thought so that well. was great yeah um and so uh she's met rochester the other thing that i really loved um was her really so the relationships between non rochester and jane characters are explored a lot more in this um, yes. and they get they give more characters like actual screen time who don't really have it in the book like john and leia but she talks to mrs fairfax a lot um and they have a lot of scenes where she's teaching adele mm -hmm. and those were the scenes that were the funniest to have the translation on <laughs> Because how often Adele is like, I can't speak English, as yeah. she says it in Spanish. <laughs> she says things like, I want to be a good English girl in Spanish. Yeah. They talk, my favorite was the first scene. They talk, they're talking about global politics of 1847, mm -hmm. specifically about colonies that England stole from Spain. Oh my gosh. And how England was really wrong to do that. And they should nice. have given it back to Spain. Not nice. that colonialism is wrong, but that it was wrong of England to do colonialism where Spain was trying to do colonialism. Amazing. I love it. <laughs> Gotta throw in some stuff for yourself. Why not? You're making it. Make your choices. <laughs> it was so brutal. <laughs> very, but very it good. was very, very funny to listen to this little girl in Spanish talk about how they, the English, were the ones who messed up um, and how she is so excited to be a good little English girl. Yes. I So a lot of those scenes take place in this garden set mm -hmm. that they've built, this like very pretty gazebo. And again, I loved these sets. They had multiple locations, which was cool to see. Very beautiful, like detailed sets. It looked like it wasn't just, you know, the four cardboard walls that they put up um, for Man Who Falls on Stairs. <laughs> yes. Um, but... I loved like how often, yeah, they were out there and they were really creative with their shots of like shooting through different foliage and also the crane work that they did for mm -hmm. the camera of how it moved with the actors. It wasn't stationary like we see with a lot of TV mm -hmm. productions. And there was in particular one scene kind of like um, a third of the way through the show when the camera, I think, follows Jane as she enters the room, and then Miss Fairfax comes, and they kind of cross paths, and then the camera follows Miss Fairfax instead. Mm -hmm. and it was just a very dynamic, fluid camera, which I liked a lot. I think it added a lot to the viewing experience. Yeah, another really similar, I mean, not quite the camera movement one, but like use of the space and set that I thought was really interesting and really provided that layer of 
It's that thing that I notice more when we're watching these foreign language ones where it's like you can't pay as much attention to the words that they're saying. So mm-hmm. it makes it honest. It makes it so that you notice the other characterization a little bit better. So for example, yeah. um, later in that same episode that I was talking about, episode five, when Rochester is explaining his story to Jane, which the dialogue is pretty classic Jane Eyre. So if you know the dialogue of that, you know the dialogue of that scene. And Jane is sitting, they go out to the garden and Jane is sitting in the light of the candles and Rochester has his back to her and he is completely in darkness. Cool. And I thought that was so interesting and like such a metaphor for their characters that Love Jane that. is this light and he is this darkness. That's awesome. See, this is one thing that I love, even if we like don't have the translations. It's mm-hmm. like, okay, you can just appreciate this visual media and see, you know, what these people in different countries are doing with this story and how they're telling it. And it's so cool. I will also say that same episode, uh, they did a fl- the flashback that we often get to Celine, um, mm-hmm. but they just did it at Thornfield. He just yes. had Celine in Thornfield. He did not explain. He just had a mistress who lived in his house <laughs> And she Which, brought her a fair man with her. Yes, it's like, come hang out at my boyfriend's place. I don't think he'll be back for a while. And the servants <laughs> are just there. And they're yeah. like, what a weirdo. Oh my gosh. Um, so there was a couple of things. So yeah, they gave us a flashback scene, which mm-hmm. not many versions do. I think the only one that really comes to mind that actually does that is the Toby Stevens one. Mm-hmm. Um, shout out to the army. Uh, and... <laughs> Then also, um, they had a very cool, elaborate dream sequence. Mm -hmm. So we're in the novel. Jane has the dream of like the crying baby and like uh, seeing Thornfield in ruins and climbing over the rubble and trying to get to Rochester. Um, This one did that. But it was so cool because like she in the dream, she's in bed in Mm -hmm. Thornfield and she wakes up to Miss Fairfax screaming and she like drags her out because like there's been this collapse and you Mm -hmm. find the main set piece that we've been spending most of the time in this kind of drawing room area by the fireplace, like beams have fallen and like you can see Grace Poole in the background in this like channel of light, like cackling and like throwing her arms around and Rochester's pinned under this big beam. And it's so cool. And I was like, damn, I love that they did all this. And it's very like they, they did a couple of flashback dreams sequence sort of things. And they put this like halo around it. And Mm -hmm. for that one, they didn't. And I truly, (laughs) so that was episode 12. We, I've been watching this for a while. And I, for just a second, I was like, whoa what are you gonna do now <laughs> Did I, I just, they're like we're jumping to the end baby so good and i was like they haven't even gotten married and you're doing the fire scene and jane's still there like what what are you gonna do and then she woke up and i was like okay you got me you got me real good, you got me really good. well done spain well played you tricked me <laughs> you did a great job um <laughs> The other scene that is that I really loved that I think they did a really great job on um, that I have a big highlighted note on is the flaming bed scene. Yeah, they did a great job. First of all, lots of like building the tension long time down the hallway, the very creepy noises there. Their sound like it's more than just music because they incorporated a lot of wind sounds during creepier moments. They incorporated a lot of like the laughing and the moaning, but in such a way that it like mixed in with these other sort of mysterious sounds that we've talked about. So they build up all this tension and then she goes into the room. First of all, she opens the door and smoke comes out. What a great effect. Good job, guys. (laughs) Um, And then she goes in and they did a great job of doing a thing that we criticize a lot of adaptations for not doing, which is Jane puts out that fire by herself. Yes, well done, Spain. <laughs> Viva la Spain. She pulls down the curtains, starts yelling at him, puts them all out, and then he wakes up and he's like, what the hell? He's like, and does the classic, is it a flood? And she's uh-huh. like, no, it's a fire. <laughs> I also loved how, um, so they filmed when... Like you first see the bed scene, there's clearly, um, I think it's like a composite. So Mm -hmm. they have footage of flame, like that they've composited in the foreground. So it looks like it's burning and then he's kind of behind it. And then when they do sort of another angle, then you actually see the drapes actually on fire, which Maria 
Louisa Merlo pulls down, stamps out, rock star. They did such a great job that I didn't even notice that it was a composite. I was like, whoa, what a great flame. <laughs> also, here's another new um, adaption choice, which I found incredibly interesting, is that so – you know, they do the thing. They open the window to let out the smoke. He gives mm-hmm. her a jacket. They sit for a while. And he's like, I'm going to go investigate something. The tapestry that hides Bertha's chamber is in his bedroom. Mm-hmm. That's fascinating to me. That, like, that almost says, and again, I didn't have the exact, like, language, like, dialogue to, like, piece these things together. But just from an interpretation of viewing that, to have your wife's kind of, like, chamber connected to your own bed chamber. That feels a bit more personal, Mm -hmm. not just like I'm going to lock her in a far chamber of the house away from me. She's right here. And if she comes down to do crimes, she has to go through my room to do it, which like makes him out to be more of kind of like her kind of um, warden of like, you know, you have to pass through me. And ideally, if I'm not drunk asleep in my bed (laughs) or you burn me first, then I can stop you from hurting Adele or doing other like problems. It's also a lot more like what a married couple would have without if you get rid of Grace and you get rid of the actual bars they put in her room um, (laughs) and you just make it a bedroom, like that's more what a married couple would have. So I think it's, it is a really interesting choice that I hadn't put together at this point in what, in my viewing. Um, Mm -hmm. So I hadn't even thought about that during that scene. Um, They do a great little goodbye after Mm -hmm. that. Um, My favorite part of that was, they do the scene sit they talk for a long time sitting down which mm-hmm. i was like there's no sexual tension if you sit down um, <laughs> and then he s- tries to shake her hand and she just fully walks away <laughs> Okay, so I think that you mentioned how, like, Catholic this take is. Um, I think that's part of it, because also, they don't kiss. Like, even after, after, like, they've proposed and stuff, there's a hug, which at first, like, you go in for the hug, and I was like, cute, I love when they do a hug first, now kiss. But he, like, goes (laughs) to kiss her, and she's like, no, like, I'm a good, like, Catholic girl, and I won't smooch you until our wedding. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. (laughs) But you want it. <laughs> but you want it so bad. Um, yeah, that's so cute. And then they do shake hands and they do have that sexual tension, but it's it's a much shorter moment. What I do love mm. that they did right after that. So we often talk about um, how an actress portrays Jane in that moment. It's her job without having her inner monologue to let the audience know that she likes being in this mm-hmm. situation and that it's not uncomfortable for her. And so right after she leaves um, the room, after the cute little handholding moment, she goes back to her bedroom. And the way they told this visually is that she flings open her windows and like the <laughs> like evening wind just blows against her face. And she just has this big smile on her face like, oh, my gosh, like I just saved my boss who I have a big crush on. And he held my hand and it was great. Yeah, so it's very they, cute. They did that well. I liked that. They did that super well. I think most of the other things are either super standard Jane Eyre or we've already talked about them. There's a great Mason scene. A note that I have here is um, Mason the vampire. He and the 1973 Sinjin should have a vampire buddy cop movie. Oh my God. His beard though. It looked like <laughs> it looked like they glued it to his chin. <laughs> that was so bad. <laughs> It was a very, like, stereotypical, like, pokey devil beard. (laughs) Yeah, he truly, and he had a coat that was, like, very vampire-esque. It was hilarious. One thing that I want to say, so from my five years of Spanish class, Mm -hmm. um, a phrase that was drilled into me because my teacher would do this exercise of telling us to stand up and sit down. And so the phrase that I heard most often in this thing was uh, siéntense, which is sit down. (laughs) <laughs> characters are constantly telling each other to sit down especially rochester he's always saying it to jane to miss fairfax like jane says it to adele all the time there's all these like sentences and i'm like oh i know that one sit i'm like a dog <laughs> i've been trained well <laughs> um yeah i think so right up at like th- up through episode like 11 or 12 I'm like a big fan of this adaptation. I'm a big fan of this Rochester. I think they're cute. I think they're doing a great job with the spooky. Um, And then it takes a turn. And it really drives home for me what we've said about Rochester. It lives and dies on the Stace Beach. Mm -hmm. Because 
it, Rochester in the book takes a turn around that time for me because he starts gaslighting her so hard. So yeah. he does, they have a great proposal scene. Do we want to talk about that? Um, I don't think we need to. It was like I said, like you said, very like true to the book. So it's mm-hmm. like we've seen many times before. Nothing super special apart yeah. from the no kiss. Yeah, it's it's a good scene. There's no kiss. Um, then he goes hard into the gaslighting her, which a mm-hmm. lot of the adaptations steer away from. And they steer into because the entire episode 13 is basically she's had this nightmare. He She comes down. Um, he keeps doing this to women because he does this to Mrs. Fairfax too. He gives her a drink and then laughs when she drinks the gasoline that he must drink because that's yes. the face these women are making. <laughs> um, and and then she goes back up to bed and then Bertha comes in and does Bertha's spooky little dance and then he gaslights her again. Yep. Which is true to the novel, so it's being honest, I guess, but just doesn't make it easy to love him. It doesn't make it easy to love him, but it does make it so that you need a redemption. Like, Rochester needs the redemption of Chapter 27. He needs the redemption of a stay speech. Yes. And instead, I'm going to do a little feminist rant here. He invites nine other men into the house, goes... Guys, I have some great news. You're going to see. We're going to a wedding. All the men get to go to the wedding. Adele, Mrs. Fairfax, all these other people that Jane knows don't get to go. Mm -hmm. They start the wedding. It gets interrupted. First of all, they do a great cliffhanger. um, And then they go to the next scene. And then he proceeds to explain to all the men in the room while Jane sits on a bench, Mm -hmm. why what he did was like, okay. And like explains his whole story. And then they all go back to the house and he doesn't bring Jane with him to see Bertha. He just gives a monologue to those nine men Mm -hmm. and they all get really sympathetic for him. And then finally we, Bertha's really scared. Like they do a good job of Bertha being really scary, all this stuff. We cut back to Jane. Jane is just in a bed upset. Rochester has not talked to her. He is not worried about her. Like he's not, he's fully forgotten that she exists for all that Mm. we've seen. Yeah. She talks to the lawyer who's like, your uncle cares about you. And then she's fully in a different outfit by the time that he, he doesn't even like wait outside the room for her. He comes to her, which means this is the first time he's coming to her. Mm -hmm. And he does a shit job of explaining himself. Yeah. It was very impassionate. Um, It felt she seemed very level-headed and accepting of being like, oh, yeah, I guess it's to be expected that you would have a crazy wife and blah, blah, blah. And they just have this like little chat where like she's at her desk and he's in a chair next to her. And it seems very friendly. And then just suddenly she's gone after that. And the lines. uh, So that's one of the ones where I like pulled up the translation to be like, are they saying something different? A lot of the lines are Jane Airlines, but they're delivered so impassionately that I no longer believe either of these people care about each other. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm like, cool, she should leave. Yeah. No, it was an odd choice and definitely harder to follow without the translations. Going back to the nine men real quick, um, (laughs) because, okay, did they give an explanation to those people's identities? Like, they're just guys from society, basically, which, like, that's another thing that pissed me off about it was, like, Rochester doesn't give a shit about society. Right. So you're bringing in all of these examples of, like, the power structure, and he's justifying himself to the power structure, but he doesn't care about the power structure. So the thing that I hypothesized of being like, who are these people? Why would they be invited to this? Is I thought that perhaps they could be his tenants because Mm. he's a landlord. And so maybe it's like they're going with this idea that it's customary to like invite your tenants to your wedding or something like that. There's no references or justification that Google Translate picked up on. Okay. That is that. It seems more like they're his peers. Okay. Um, I would love um, if someone who is Spanish, who listens to this show, if you Mm -hmm. have an insight into if if there's a cultural reason for why those guys came and like attended the wedding, let us know that maybe we're missing something. But from our perspective, patriarchy, then that is a cultural understanding that I already have. There you go. (laughs) But yeah, that's all I could imagine. I was like, it's a guy party now. Look at all the suits. It was so (laughs) infuriating. It was so, I was like annoyed by it, but I was like, whatever. Like, it's just 
guests at the wedding. Like it has always been weird that nobody goes to their wedding. Mm-hmm. I guess this makes sense. And then as soon as he is more worried about what they think about him than what Jane thinks about him, I'm like, not only is this worse, but it's not Jane Eyre. This is not Rochester. This is not the character. Like you're doing a disservice to the character. Um, Like I can get over certain things, but like it pissed me off. And then the last episode was boring and I wasn't happy for the ending because Mm -hmm. she went back with someone who didn't give a shit about her. Totally. So real quick, let's talk about her moment away from Thornfield. Mm -hmm. So she, because we don't have Sinjin or the Rivers family, it's implied to me that she goes in search of the doctor who helped her when she was a little girl. She goes, so that's another one where the translation was helpful. So she essentially, we see the, all these different cut scenes of Jane speaking directly to camera. Mm -hmm. Um, And she is just saying over and over again, the different kinds she's offering to do different kinds of work at all of these different doors. So we're not given the background of where they are, but like she starts by asking for work that she is, could do like being a governess then she goes to offer to be like a lady's maid. And then she offers to work in a workhouse. And then she goes to a hospital and is just asking to work there. Okay. And then she happens to pass out in the hospital where okay. the man she knew also works. The Because I, I could hear the name of the doctor that she was asking for. And it Lloyd. sounded to me like it was maybe the one who helped her when she was a little girl. Which um, it, it was. Okay, cool. Awesome. So that makes sense. Yeah. So, okay, cool. Now we know that. Um, I did like, so this is also a version that has quite a few scenes where we see like end of the story, Jane, like journaling as if she's Mm -hmm. writing um, the autobiography of Jane Eyre. And then, yeah, I thought it was interesting that we had these kind of fourth wall camera moments where she talks directly into the camera, like speaking to us one-on-one. So that Mm -hmm. was also an interesting choice. But yeah, so she ends up at this hospital, passes out, um, they give her a bed and she's hanging out there and stuff. And then she hears someone like deranged shouting the name Mr. Rochester mm-hmm. goes to investigate and it's Grace Poole. Mm-hmm. Um, and so Grace then I don't have the exact info of how she ended up in the hospital herself, apart from they just took her there after this traumatic experience of Bertha burning the house down. It looks like she has like bandages on her arms. So I think mm-hmm. she's supposed to have been injured in the fire. Okay. So she gives Jane this kind of backstory that we need to know that uh, this guy who didn't bother to explain to her is now single and ready to mingle. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) follow the sound of the piano. You'll find him playing his little heart out. (laughs) Yeah, you you can be blind, but as long as you get to keep your hand, you can play the piano, which I did fully write in my notes. I wish this man had lost his hand. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Well, they had to give that actor the ability to show off his piano chops. True. He was like, it was also a very like happy song. It didn't sound like a moody, like I'm blind and my lover is gone and my house burned down song. It, it sounded like a so la 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 <laughs> I may be blind, but I can still play piano. <laughs> also, yeah. that house didn't look like the manor house that he moves to. It looked like a church. Um yeah. It Again, was, they're bringing it all back to church. They, they all, loved that. <laughs> I will say that was one of the things. I'm sure we missed, I would have loved, especially since we just had our theology episode, Mm -hmm. um, I would have loved to have been able to have the translation mostly to understand the nuance of their commentary on religion, because I think they just made it very pro church yeah, and not something because they add like a priest character and some Mm -hmm. other things in here that I'm like, this is just very pro religion. A <laughs> uh, priest who likes th- to uh, pull the cork, obviously, because he he was at the house and the guy uh, Rochester is just like he's like, hey, you want another one? And he's like, he's like, I should, but I will. And he just like kept having lots of drinks. Um, there was also a church scene that I thought was really interesting. Um, again, going off of the kind of grace pool red herring, mm-hmm. they really lean into like she is suspicious as to being the source of this like spookiness and trauma, because when we do see her, we see how much caring for Bertha affects her Mm -hmm. and the toll that it's taking. And there's a very interesting scene where 
Jane goes to the church and she sees this woman, this cloaked woman kind of sitting in a pew looking very distraught. And she goes over to like comfort her and it's grace. And she's like, Oh, like, are you okay? What's going on? Blah, blah, blah. And I didn't get obviously the words, but grace just kind of has this moment of like, just like, leave me alone. I'm really upset right now. And the undertone is my job sucks and I hate caring for this lady. Mm -hmm. So um, it was an interesting moment to have that there. Yeah, I think there's, that's, that's, I think what's so heartbreaking to me about these last two episodes is like, there's so much that's so good in this adaptation. Yeah. And then those last two episodes make me hate it. Totally. Which is totally fair. Um, So that's kind of all my main thoughts on this version. Anything else that you feel that we need to touch on that we haven't? Yeah, that's, that's everything I have. Just, um, it is our second longest adaptation that we've watched. So it beats the Italian miniseries, which had been in second place. So the top five of the longest ones, um, starting from number five is the 1994 radio adaptation with, uh, Kieran Hines. Kieran, yay. <laughs> um, the 1973 miniseries is number four, then the Italian miniseries, then the Spanish miniseries, and then longest is still Autobiography of Jane Eyre web series. Um, so that's that's really everything that I have before we do ratings. Yeah, same. Um, do you want to go first or should I? I will go first. Okay. Um, I'm going to give this six out of ten men. <laughs> it was a lot higher before the last two episodes. Awesome. Um, I'm going to give this seven out of 10 rosas, which Ooh. is roses. Cause nice. he talked about roses a lot and I kept yes. being like, Ooh, I know that word. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of this rose metaphor that I was not following a hundred percent of, but I think it was <laughs> meant to be a romantic situation. Yeah. Um, but yeah, all in all, I'm really, I'm with you. I'm really glad we watched it. I think it was really interesting. Um, very much a, uh, a, it's, it's hard you guys are, I, we love you and I love doing this. It's hard to watch over four hours of a show in a language you don't speak. <laughs> right. When you aren't allowed to multitask because you'll miss everything if you're not looking at it. Cause that's mm-hmm. the only part you can comprehend. Yup. Um, so you're welcome. We did that for you. <laughs> But we have a couple of things coming up. So next episode, which is two weeks from today, because we are still on summer hours, um, is going to be a very special one that we are both really excited about. It is um, an interview with Betsy Cornwell, um, the author of Reader, I Murdered Him, which is a fantastic book. Mm -hmm. Uh, You guys have two weeks. Go read it right now. You're there's twists and turns in this. There are true spoilers. Yes. Um, Not unlike really source material, it. Jane Eyre, there is a big twist at the end. And it's like, whoa, <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, and there's other, lots of other twists in there that I didn't anticipate. It's a great, it's such a fun story. It's a very cathartic story. It's a very Jane Eyre story. Um, it it takes, follows Adele. Yes. It's about her kind of growing up and what happens to her after the events of Jane Eyre. Yeah which is, it it does have simultaneous to Jane Eyre and then afterwards, which I think is really fantastic. Um, but I also will, we're, so we're recording some of these episodes a little bit early so that we, uh, cause one of us is getting married at the end of next month. <laughs> C'est moi. It's, could be me, could be Piper. We'll find out then. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, because of that, we are going to do our next palate cleanser survey a little bit early so that we can get watching that and recording an episode so that you guys don't see any interruption in our summer hours. Mm -hmm. Um, So we are doing our next survey on um, a few different adaptations of Weathering Heights. We're finally going to watch it. I have avoided spoilers so far. Please don't spoil this for me. Um, (laughs) But we have four adaptations that we will be asking you guys about. Again, as always, you can vote on all of our social and you get five times the vote. Hold on. That can't be right. Let me check. (laughs) Yes, it's five times if you vote in our Patreon. But wait, there's more. (laughs) But wait, there's more. That's too good a deal. Yeah. If you uh, decide to sign up for Patreon, 
three little dollars, um, send Just it to $3. us. Yeah. Then your, your vote counts for more. You can influence, uh, unlike, um, well, no, I was going to make a political statement there. I'm not going to, this is a <laughs> nice place. So I'm going to leave that joke behind. Anyway, you can also get access to behind the scenes stuff of how we make the show. Our silly little goobers actually talking to you eye to eye. Cause we have video recordings. Mm-hmm. Um, Lillian puts a lot of cool effort into making longer video episodes for us. And I made a radio special that is very dramatic and fun that is hand chosen songs uh inspired by the life and times of uh one edward fairfax rochester it's so so much better whatever you're imagining because i knew when piper (laughs) was making this i knew what she was doing and i it's it's so much better than what you think it is. Whatever oh, you're picturing in your head, this is better. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> so all of that is available if you give us some money on Patreon. And also um, we give you our love and support. And if for whatever reason you don't have three extra dollars that you really want to give to two goobers who talk about Jane Eyre, I, I, while I don't support it, I do understand it. Um, <laughs> I, we also have other ways you can hang out and talk to us. Um, you can find us across all social media at AirBuds. Um, we are on Twitter, Instagram. I started a threads that I don't really post on, but could if you guys follow us there. Um, <laughs> there's a bunch of things on YouTube uh, and other channels that are escaping me. If you're not a social media person, but you still have thoughts you want to share, I have great news on that front as well. You can email us, airbuds at gmail.com. Wow. And we respond to all of those. We so do. We love talking with you guys there. Um, if you also want to leave a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice, it helps put our podcast in front of more people. And it really makes our day every now and then we'll get a comment from somebody and they're like, I just found you guys and this is the best. And it's like, <laughs> oh, you're the best. So- we had somebody who started binging our podcast on YouTube. Hello, sir. Um, <laughs> and he like went back and listened to old episodes and was commenting on them. And I was like, you can't listen to this much of our podcast. It'll break your brain. It's so good, though. So thank you for doing that. It makes us so happy. (laughs) Welcome to the family. (laughs) Welcome, welcome. So that's all for now, you guys. Um, Hasta luego. Thank you for joining us. Um, Happy Jane Eyre reading and watching. We love you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.